Um, so yes, I'm Steven from Deca Games. Uh, I'm here to talk about live ops. So a uh, quick introduction to Deca Games. Uh, we, are, uh, we were founded about two years ago, just under two years ago now. Uh, two year anniversary is coming right up next month. Uh, we're comprised of a bunch of uh, very experienced free to play professionals from some of the companies you'll see on the bottom right hand of the screen. Um, we're, head, we're uh, I guess you could call us an indie publisher, but we're very different from a typical publisher in that we don't really look uh, at marketing new games. We're actually focused more on live operations and games as a service, and I'll show you a little bit more about what I mean by that in a few uh, few minutes. Uh, we're headquartered in Berlin, but uh, we're actually distributed globally uh, throughout North America and also mostly in Eastern Europe, and that allows us to support games globally in a more cost-effective manner, which helps us and our partners a lot. So um, I myself joined um, from Six Waves, which is a publisher back in the day was the number one publisher on Facebook and, and also very successful now mobile publisher in Asia. So um, back when I joined the gaming industry during the social gaming era, uh, I would say it wasn't easier, but it was very, very understood in terms of how to make a game successful. If you had a lot of a, a, a large network in terms of DAU or MAU, you can release a new game and you'd get a lot of critical mass to the game. And, and if it has you know strong mechanics, you'll chances are pretty high the game will be successful. Um, nowadays, it's actually probably tougher than ever to to make a game successful um, because that model doesn't work anymore. It's more about user acquisition and how much you have in your war chest to spend on marketing and user acquisition. So um, I'll show you what I mean. Um, this is sort of your typical user acquisition or marketing funnel. At the top of the funnel, you've got huge developers and publishers spending hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars on marketing and user acquisition to acquire users. But as you move further and further down the funnel, you're actually wasting a lot of this marketing, uh, of these marketing dollars. So users are not necessarily activating or staying in the game. You guys probably know the retention numbers of your game. Typically after day 30, it's not looking good, right? Um, anything over 12 to 15% is exceptional for day 30 retention. Um, not to mention all the way at the bottom of the funnel, you're, in terms of your paying users, industry average is around 2%. So, if you're spending millions of dollars and you're getting that little back, I would submit that it's really not the most effective way to extract value in terms of your, your marketing dollars. Um, I'm not here to say that marketing is not important. Obviously, if you have, if you have really, really uh, great marketing strategy or strong marketing partners, that makes a great difference, especially on launch day. Um, but it's not really a sustainable way to make your game successful. And I think even your, the biggest players in the industries, your machine zones, et cetera, you're seeing them start to dial it back as well because they, even they cannot realize good ROI from this sort of marketing, traditional marketing strategy. So what comes next? You spend a lot of money on, on your, your marketing. Um, over time, your game is going to get even more and more difficult to market, right? It's just it's a proven fact. It's harder to market an older game. Um, at the same time, you're, you know, there's other competitors or your, your studios or your, you know, your partners are launching new games. Um, and that, because you're launching new games, you're shifting your existing resources to those new titles because you want your best people on your newest stuff, your highest priority projects. Uh, because of that, your older games are going to suffer. Um, players lose interest because you're not updating the game as often. Um, and because of that, inevitably, the game's going to decline. It's just a matter of fact, most games decline uh, over time, and especially uh, in shorter, shorter periods of, of uh, time now because people have shorter attention spans. So um, unfortunately, what that means is there's a lot of, lot of great products out there that are just undervalued and, and have limited growth potential. So at this point, what, do, what are the options? So normally, there's sort of two options. Behind door number one, you can actually kind of just keep the game sitting there, maintenance mode, don't really pay attention to it. Um, players are not really happy about that because you're not really updating or, or improving or, or giving them new content to play. Um, you could also you know, have a skeleton team or, or farm it out to, to someone, but um, that's not really the highest quality level of service. Um, usually these are work for hire studios that kind of just do really basic stuff and, and um, it's really not much better than, than just letting it sit there. Uh, door, num door number two, you can actually just sunset the game. Just cut your losses, um, you can you know, basically move all your teams to, to new projects. Uh, I would submit that there's a third option, which is obviously live operations, which, which is what I'm here to talk to you guys about today. So typically, you know, we think about live operations as events, updates to the game. It's very uh, metrics-driven, very KPI-driven and, and tactical. 
Um, I want to show you guys that there is another way to handle live operations, and this is kind of how we define live ops at Deca Games um, by creating an experience that players will come back to daily for decades. And I've highlighted the word experience because most of the time people are, as I mentioned, t thinking about tactics. What can I do in terms of a, a live ops cadence or an event to uplift the, the KPI of my game, right? Um, and it's typically something that developers will actually look to tack on at the end or towards the end of their development. What can we do uh, in terms of live ops? So we have to start thinking about that after a game is, is you know, getting close to launch ready. And it's actually quite the opposite. It's not something that you can really bolt on at the end. It's something that you have to think about from the very beginning. And I'll show you what we're, what we're talking about. So this is um, a case study from a game that we're, we've been working on at Deca Games called Realm of the Mad God. Uh, so Realm of the Mad God was, uh, I guess you could call it an indie hit. It was a web and, uh, I guess, PC game uh, launched in 2010. Uh, I would describe it as a free-to-play uh, RPG co-op, uh, permadeath, so a pretty core game. Um, not for the faint of heart, but very, very successful. Had a, had a sort of good indie audience behind it. Um, the game was acquired by Kabam back in 2012, and uh, unfortunately, by the time that deal was done, uh, Kabam had a lot of other high-priority projects that were generating a lot more revenue. So relative to, to those games, this game kind of got lost in the shuffle. Um, never really got a chance to, to take off. So by 2014, there was a skeleton team there. Um, we acquired the game uh, about two years ago. Um, so we felt that the game really had a lot of potential, but we had to figure out how to unlock that potential, that the core gameplay was really fun, but what else can we do? So the first thing that we did was we actually, well, actually, the first thing we did was play the hell out of the game, spent a lot of time playing the game, but uh, what we realized quickly was there is actually a lot of people out there that knew the game way better than we did, and we call these guys our super fans. So who are your super fans? They're these guys. So the guys that are super passionate about your game, they eat, sleep, breathe your game, they know it inside and out, probably as well, if not better than you do. So um, we spent a ton of time communicating. Uh, well, once we found these guys, we spent a ton of time communicating with them. So they could be in Reddit, in their own wikis and forums, in, in groups somewhere. We spent a lot of time figuring out where they were and introducing ourselves and just finding out as much as we could about, about Realm. So um, what we found out right away was that there was actually a serious problem with the game. So uh, this was the, the core game loop of the game in the white. So uh, when Kabam actually, uh, I guess, acquired the game, it was fun, but it lacked a lot of depth and, and people weren't spending enough money or enough time in the game. So Kabam added this uh, pet system where, where people could buy and fuse pets. So it did add a lot of depth to the game, but it also created a lot of problems because it was very expensive and it was very overpowered. So it created this huge divide between your payers and your non-payers. And, and so created, consequently, there was a lot of churn. Um, and it was a very divisive kind of thing with the game. So we were making less money, but from a, a, less, a smaller group of people, let's say. And, and that's not the approach that we really wanted to take. So um, once we got you know, the direct communication going with our, our super fans, we realized that this was a huge issue. And we started to talk to them about how we can address this issue. So, so basically, um, when we announced that we were, we were taking over the game, they were super excited. Um, it actually became... Uh, the number one uh, subreddit on Reddit, it got featured on the homepage. We tried to capitalize this as well by, by posting updates on social media to, to, to try to build the buzz about the game. And at this point, we hadn't even made a ton of changes yet. We were still talking to our players. Um, from their perspective, it was still uh, the same player experience, but they were just super excited because someone was finally coming and paying attention to this game that they had been playing loyally for years, and they had no one listening to them. So. Um, the next thing we did was actually enlist our best players, and we hired them to be part of the team. So uh, we got them involved in game balancing um, and as beta testers. So I'm sure you guys have beta tested your friends' games or, or you know, games from your peers. It's really fun to you know, be ahead of the curve and see what's coming. Um, and we had an idea of what we wanted to do to the game, but um, we were able to use these super fans as our sounding board to bounce ideas off of, and they provided really awesome, very detailed feedback about what's the best way to execute that, what would work best for them, and what doesn't work for them. The other thing we did was invest in tools. So we gave these players a lot of ways to customize um, their characters in terms of skins. So um, that, that was a little bit ahead of the curve. You can see um, this is now sort of more of a trend in terms of free-to-play games. 
um, cosmetic changes that really don't have a ton of effect on the game, but just make the experience more fun for players. Um, we also allowed players to create their own dungeons, so user-generated content became a huge uh, advantage for us. It was a game changer for us because, as I mentioned, these super fans knew the game way better than we did. They were looking to create stuff that you know, created a lot of fun and a lot of challenge for their own community. So rather than just being some random developer you know, pushing some buttons, these were their own peers creating content for their own peer groups and their own peer friends, and then they could play cooperatively together to try to see if they could conquer those dungeons. So if you remember the previous game loop, this is kind of how it looks today and how we improved it. So um, basically, we increased the drop rates and optimized the, uh, I guess, uh, lowered the upgrade cost. So it's re really de-emphasizing the pet system that was so divisive before. And we emphasize the customization aspect of the game. So uh, because there are all these new custom skins and, and things in the game, they, these were the items that people were chasing. And, and because they're so unique and so different, um, so it became this really cool uh, virtuous cycle, which um, I can't say we planned 100%, but uh, we stumbled upon it, and, and it's worked really well for us since then. So um, yeah, it was definitely uh, a really awesome experience. On top of that, we also invested a lot of time in improving the overall player experience in, in the ways that I've listed here. So um, these are things that, unfortunately, are very, very difficult to quantify in terms of like the ROI that you'll receive in, in, in the game. Uh, but we feel like they're really, really critical in terms of improving um, the live ops and, and making your super fans happy. So I would encourage you to kind of do a lot of these quality of life improvements as well, see if you can improve the overall experience, and do it on a regular basis. Don't just clean house once a year, do it a couple weeks, every month, every quarter, whatever you guys can manage. All right, so how did we do? Um, in terms of results, um, we, since we took the game over about two years ago, uh, we've doubled the DAU. Uh, more importantly, we've actually tripled the number of what we call DAC, which is daily active customers, essentially your super fans, the people that have spent money in the game. So that's really, really critical. Um, the game is uh, eight years old now, and we are now basically having a record year, um, which is pretty unheard of in terms of, of an older title. Um, so that's a revenue trend. I'm not, not going to tell you the exact number. We can talk about that later. Um, but most importantly, we've spent zero money on user acquisition. So purely focusing on the community by focusing on our, our community of super fans, we're able to grow a game eight years after its initial launch. So if you remember the initial marketing funnel that we were talking about where everyone's spending millions of dollars to acquire a very, very small set of paying users, we've essentially flipped that around. So uh, we, we focused on a very, very small subset of super fans, listened to them, heard them out, and really provided what they're looking for. And they're able to bring us a lot of things, including re-engaging their friends, bringing new players into the game, um, and a host of other benefits. So, um, this was a really, really cool strategy that worked well for us, and, and we're continuing to do so at DECA. So for your games, I would encourage you guys to, to try to find where your super fans are, listen to them, hear them out, try to give them what they want, because they obviously love your game a lot, and they will reward you probably tenfold. So um, my final slide, um, this is actually a, a screenshot of players in the game, and they kind of banded together to kind of show them to show us how much they loved what we were doing in the game. So that's all I've got. Thank you very much. All right. Hi, my name is Iyad from Tomatum Games. Um, I want to ask you, how do you communicate usually with your customers, your loyal customers? Um, so I mentioned like we found most of our players, in the case of Realm of the Mad God, most of them were on Reddit. And um, we just interacted with them directly within that thread that they were you know, already in. And we would be very, very transparent the entire time. You know, we're working with Deca Games, or we're from Deca Games, and actually, that um, you know, open and transparent communication was quite critical because then it, it gave them the feeling that they're speaking directly to us, and we, they have a direct impact on sort of how the game takes shape. So, um, hi, thank you for your talk. Um, we try to listen to our players and we, we do that in our forum, but we have the feeling that uh, there's always only the loud minority. And uh, it's more like, if we do what they say, there are so many silent voices who are not on Reddit, who are not on the forum, uh, who we might in, in, uh, make angry. And uh, how would you handle that? That's a really, really good point. I mean, there is, that's, 
sort of in social media these days, there's the very, very vocal minority and, and how do you kind of filter those people that know what they're talking about? I don't have the answer to that because I, I was not in, heavily involved in, in the product itself, but um, I would say um, we spent a lot of time actually with the initial hires that we brought to the team and they would kind of know the top players themselves and, and have interacted with them because it's a cooperative game, right? So they would really know if this is like someone, you know, that's really, um, you know, one of the top players or if this is just someone that just joined recently that's just making a ton of noise. So um, I think it really depends and, and I'm not sure what kind of, you know, data you can see in terms of who, that, who this player is and what their behavior is, but I would try to dig down into that behavior and see, okay, is this really, you know, someone that's just trolling and just signed up with a new account recently or, has they, have they been around for a long time? It, it depends on the kind of the, the data that you have in place, I would say. GDPR, all right. Hey, Stephen. Michael Hines from Amazon. Hey, Michael. Hey, you guys are putting a fair amount of work into working with these games. So is there a critical mass of monthly average users or daily active users that you're looking for before you'll kind of invest this? And how do you do that math? Mm, yeah, uh, there is no critical mass of DAU, actually. For us, it's a combination of things when we decide to take on a game. Um, obviously, revenue is a, a big part of the picture, so um, if we're looking at taking over a game, it ideally should have performed at some point in its life cycle. Um, but most importantly for us, uh, the community, as I mentioned, and then um, how passionate our team is about the game. And uh, because, you know, unfortunately, if, we, if the game is making a ton of money and we don't feel like we'd be psyched about working on it, we'll probably pass. Hi, thanks for the talk. Hi. Um, could you get, provide maybe a little bit more um, detail into how you handle the situation where you're introducing new mechanics to a very old player base, oftentimes? Right. And more often than not, <clears throat> my experience on live games is that they're very resistant to change. Yeah. So did you ever have instances where you made a mistake and had to roll back? Or, and could you yeah, talk, actually, speak to that? How did you handle that absolutely. kind of thing? Um, you're spot on. We actually, so when we roll out new features, we actually have a, like a, a test server. So we actually allow our, some of our beta testers on that test server before we actually roll out into production. So yeah, it's, it's kind of a weird approach, but it's worked for us. So yeah, so I, I got a question for you. So, um, so I think we heard it a few times, like decision making, I think it's one of the artists point. Uh, and the question that was raised. So how, how do you, I mean, there's always gut feeling KPIs and then the community. So how, how do you ponderate these decisions into the next update that you're going to do? And, and how will you uh, do that like in a year from now or five years from now? Uh, do you see a change into how you will you do those updates? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think eventually there's going to be fatigue over time if you're just cycling the same events. So we are, we're always trying to get, get together and brainstorm new ideas on a regular basis, I guess our product leads. And we do that across different game teams as well. So we're trying to share best practices, uh, amongst like what our what our other teams have seen or what we've seen in the across the industry, among games that we've played as as you know just on a personal level as gamers, and we just try to you know collaborate and bounce ideas off of each other. So there's not really like a standard method where we rule things out or, or okay things. Um, but the beauty is that we have the trust of our players, so we're able to roll things out or bounce ideas off of them, and they're usually very very honest with us and 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 if something's not working, they'll let us know very very vocally and we'll know right away so so also the the game is a, is a web browser game Correct. right right so uh based into your past experience how 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 do you you know see the difference of community on a web browser game versus a mobile game hmm Good question. I think they're harder to find on a mobile game just because there's going to be a, a slight disconnect, although that's starting to change with some of the tools that are coming out there. Um, it's actually, I think it's actually been a little bit easier on browser. Um, on mobile, you kind of have to go dig into you know, where, where they are, and that takes you kind of away from the game. So, but nowadays, there's more and more kind of mobile community stuff, like you know, clan play or this kind of thing, where uh, or even like WeChat groups or WhatsApp groups for players within uh, a certain game. You just have to kind of find them and, and do a little bit of digging, but they're out there. And when you communicate with your players, obviously when you're on mobile, you use push notification and all that. And when you're on web browser, it's email only or you're using other channels of communication like we Facebook e login? Yeah, we do email or actually when they load the game, there, there'll be a pop-up or you know, what have you that, that sort of provides them more info on, on updates. And what's next for Deca Games? 
What's next is we're looking for more great games that are undervalued, have really high quality product, um, just need a little bit more love and attention. So that's, that's why I'm here. If you've got a great game, let's talk. So, uh, yeah, nice talk, thanks. Uh, uh, I used to actually play the game a lot. I've yeah. sunk hundreds of hours into it. And um, I was wondering if uh, uh, I know that there was uh, sort of an economy in the game. Uh, we would um, trade defense po potions, and it was sort of like made as a currency. Um, and people would trade different items with defense pots or different potions, uh, which were really hard to acquire. I, I was really wondering, um, if you changed, if the changes that you introduced actually Im impacted the way the players traded, and um, if not, well, uh, did you do anything to actually alter the economy that you know the players basically made out of nowhere? Yeah, um, I'm not. I didn't get as deep into the game as you did, so and I wasn't around at that that time of transition, so I can't really comment like with a lot of authority there. I don't want to say the wrong thing. Um, I'm not aware of huge changes to the economy, so, but I can get back to you, I can check with the team and see how, how that was impacted. That's a really good question. Thank you so much, Steven, it was awesome. Thanks, guys.